Homburg, Alchemist or Chemist, a short essay by Bruce Mills, otherwise known as the Obligate Pedestrian. Wilhelm von Homburg, 1652-1715. Homburg was a German philosopher born in Batavia, Jakarta. The Wikipedia describes Homburg as a natural philosopher on the transition between alchemy and chemistry and states that while he did attempt chrysopoeia, he nevertheless made a solid contribution towards chemistry, the implication being that anyone looking into the manufacture of gold must be a non-scientific idiot. Many writers refer to metallic transmutation with an emphasis on the use of the term transmutation as a kind of denigration, as though such investigation into reactions involving gold was something other than a scientific investigation into laboratory process. They don't say manufacturing gold, they say transmuting lead into gold, as the former sounds technological while the latter sounds magical. In modern terms, transmutation is also used to refer to legitimate nuclear reactions, but typically with the implication that alchemists were bad chemists and knew nothing of nuclear reactions, and so are still wrong, just magical mystics. Brass, in modern terms, is an alloy of copper with about 20% zinc, although that varies from about 40% to 5%. It has been known since antiquity. The earliest alloys were made simply by smelting zinc-rich copper ores, and so one does not have to have an understanding of its nature. The ancient Romans, however, manufactured it deliberately by mixing metallic copper with zinc minerals. Bronze, in modern terms, is an alloy of copper and about 10% tin. The earliest artefacts of bronze are actually arsenical bronze, which substitutes arsenic for tin. Bronze is clearly a manufactured metal, that is, it was made by deliberately mixing copper with other materials since around 4000 BC or so. The terms brass and bronze do not refer to a single specific material any more than the term plastic does. Rather, brass and bronze were various alloys composed of more than 60% copper with other materials. The study of these materials was part of metallurgy, which has been classified with, or at least studied by, alchemists over the centuries in ancient and medieval times. Steel is a material based on iron with carbon impurities, and perhaps some other materials. Again, steel is not a specific material, but a class of materials. It has been known since around 2000 BC. The Iron Age took over from the Bronze Age as manufactured steel became stronger than manufactured bronze, which had been the strongest material. Bronze and brass also have the property of looking a lot like gold. Various treatments of copper and other materials can be manufactured that look a lot like gold. The idea was natural that perhaps gold was some alloy of copper. Various people attempting then to manufacture gold. Over the centuries, the failure to manufacture anything with the exact behaviour of natural gold and the failure to separate gold into components, even in the hottest available furnace, eventually led to the conclusion that gold was an element. But exactly what that meant changed over the centuries. A partway position was that while gold was made up from other elements, the temperature and pressure required were beyond those available to humans. Around 1200 to 1600, a lot of talk was about the idea that gold was made inside the earth slowly, rather like diamonds. Keep in mind that graphite and diamonds are different isomers on the phase diagram of carbon, so the concept that gold was on the phase diagram of copper was not, in and of itself, an absurd idea, especially when copper plus zinc or tin produced very different metals, and some alloys did look very similar to gold. It is common to suggest that everybody knows in the 21st century that it is silly and non-scientific to try to make gold from copper, as gold is an element. But the reality is the other way around. The justification for gold being an element came from the long-term failure to manufacture it. A significant reason for the fall from grace of Chrysopoeia was the publication of a paper in 1722 after Homburg died by Geoffroy, a protégé and collaborator of Homburg, that discussed frauds and errors within the study of Chrysopoeia. This seems to have led rapidly to it having a bad social reputation, 
rather than refuting the basic idea of manufacturing gold. As a result, the topic was dropped, rather like cold fusion in the 20th century. It was around this time that the popularity of other practices, now mostly classed as alchemy, also took a nosedive. Everything bad was packaged under that term and jettisoned by the mainstream. There was, at the time, no sound theoretical reason to drop it entirely. The known theory and experimental data did not imply that it was impossible. There was the practical point that people had been trying to do it for centuries and so far had not produced any definite positive results, other than materials that looked a lot like gold, but this is also true of various prospective technologies that were eventually created. Homburg claimed to have manufactured gold from mercury, which was an error in assaying. Mercury dissolves gold and it can be hard to work out exactly how much gold has really been returned after experiments involving this. The distinction today is the conclusion would be rejected out of hand and the error looked for, but if it is not clear that it cannot be done, then it is not obvious to look for the error. The measurement was valid experimental evidence for the manufacture of gold. Around 1730, the transmutation of the classical metals was rejected by the mainstream science, and so people who continued this work had to do so on the quiet. The work continued for about another 40 years before shifting to become mainly crankish pursuit. This, of course, is a social and linguistic reason why the linguistic separation between transmutation and manufacture exists but it does not justify the position in terms of historical and technical truth. Princip credits Homburg with the creation of a comprehensive theory of chymistry. Homburg lived fairly contemporarily with John Freund, 1675-1728, who also tried to construct a comprehensive theory of chymistry based on a primitive atomic theory. Princip says that he, Princip, is interested in how scientific theories developed, how large collections of observations were crafted into comprehensive theories. While I think that Princip and myself are very much of a similar interest here, I disagree with that characterization. The issue is not the crafting of a large collection of observations into a scientific theory. It is about the logical compactification of a large number of fairly direct statements into a small number of indirect statements from which the large number can be deduced. There is no definite point in this process when it suddenly becomes a scientific theory. There is a gradual improvement in compactness. Often that compactness comes at the price of a lack of generality, leading to the fact that most use of core scientific theories, such as quantum theory, require an indefinite number of auxiliary assumptions to make them work. There is often very little acknowledgement of the fact that first principle derivations from quantum theory are difficult to impossible in practical context. The theory is believed, so the principle that it would work is also believed, even when the evidence is really not there. Specifically, I mean, it is often believed that quantum mechanics calculations from first principles would always get the right answer, even though those calculations are beyond the ability of the best contemporary supercomputers. Quantum mechanics has shown itself to be a highly useful theory. It is a great achievement in my opinion, perhaps the greatest ever, but that does not justify assuming it will continue to work in all cases, especially when most uses involve strong extra assumptions to make them work. There are four versions of the textbook of Homburg from different times in his life, making it possible to determine in great detail how his ideas changed over a period of several decades at a time of great significance in the history of science. Lavoisier was one of the academians, the French Royal Academy of Science, who pulled Homburg's work out of storage 60 years later and based his work on that of Homburg and Geoffroy. In 1705, Homburg gave a lecture in which he announced his conclusions about sulphur, Sulphur pre-1700 was not sulphur the element of the 19th century chemistry, but sulphur the principle, alchemical, if one wants to say it that way. The idea of the principle of sulphur is that all things that combust have a common component or nature that is, more or less, the nature of combustion. Things that cause combustion were sulphurous materials, also referred to in some contexts as oils. Homburg attempted a heavy analysis to isolate the pure principle of sulphur. From a modern perspective, this does not have to be possible. 
Quarks are a good example of something that in the 21st century it is believed much matter is made up from, but also that it is essentially impossible to isolate a macroscopic lump of pure quark material in a jar in the laboratory. The closest we might hope to come to that is a quark gluon plasma, but this cannot be isolated in a jar on the desk. Homburg stated that the analysis was very difficult, that is, it was hard to find anything in common with all combustible materials. Some, yes, and some others as well, but not so much all combustible materials. The 21st century reader might be primed to say, of course not, since combustion is combination with oxygen. There is no element of fire common to all combustible materials, but this would be anachronistic. The idea of combustion being combination with oxygen specifically is a much later one. At the time, Homburg meant as the core idea a rapid spontaneous reaction generating heat and flame. This is a highly exothermic reaction, one that generates a lot of energy. Homburg's conclusion was that the common element of all combustible materials is light. Since the energy and the bonds of the atom are indeed electromagnetic fields, the conclusion that exothermic reactions are releasing light from the material is pretty much on the mark from 21st century perspective. In that sense, the oxygen could be seen as being just a catalyst. In discussing the accuracy of biographies of Homburg, Princip notes that most prior biographies borrow almost entirely from the elegies by French writer Bernard de Fontenelle of members of the French Academy, of which he was also a member, in particular which were to promote and elevate the position of the Academy in the public view. Fontenelle promoted the idea of the heroic struggle against the murky and disrespectable past of chemistry and alchemy by the members of the Academy. Hence, he was a large part of the social change that occurred circa 1730, in which alchemy became a study of ill repute and the world forged ahead into the bright future of chemistry. This resonates curiously with the downfall of Euclidean geometry circa 1830 and of classical chemistry circa 1930, which was replaced in principle, if not in practice, by quantum chemistry. Homburg was apparently encouraged by Otto von Goerck to look into the interaction between light and matter, so there is a precedent for the conclusion of Homburg that light was the common element of combustion. In particular, Goerck seems to have been interested in the Bologna stone, which is apparently barium sulphide and glows persistently once manufactured. Another persistently luminous material is calcium nitrate, known as hermetic phosphorus. White phosphorus is an allotrope of phosphorus that can be prepared from human urine. The process for making it was learned by Homburg from Kunkel. A particular point here is that Homburg learned by observing the process in the laboratory. Many of the alchemical preparations relied on a meticulous laboratory discipline and intricate details of the method. This is one reason for the failure of many modern chemists to duplicate the processes from the text alone. The modern chemical methods have very much been chosen to be less finickety, to work as long as some basic chemical laboratory skills have been mastered. As such, the modern chemistry confronted with the delicate and detailed manual process required for the completion of the old chemical methods often gives up in disgust and declares the process unworkable. Many contemporaries of Homburg learned the recipe for white phosphorus but failed to make it because they had learned it only from reading about it and had never seen it made. And it only makes it non-scientific in the sense of failure to achieve an ideal rather than a matter of falsehood and magic. The experiments in particle physics at CERN are also very hard to repeat, except at CERN. Also, 20th century science has an obsession with the idea that a concept should be transmissible via plain text and diagrams, which actually limits the options for kinds of knowledge that can be gained. There is still something to be said for the idea of apprenticeship and visceral involvement of the whole person with the environment in the process of learning. On page 32 of Princip, The Transmutations of Chemistry, it's stated that Boyle and Homburg, who presumably got the secret from him, could create philosophical mercury, otherwise known as incalescent mercury. The Royal Society website today says that philosophical mercury is the fabled mercury that can transform lead into gold. 
That would make it kin, at least, to the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone was often described as red powder that should be sprinkled in molten metal. This also resonates with the point that mercuric oxide is a reddish-orange colour. Mercury easily forms an amalgam with gold, dissolving a lump of gold placed in a cup of mercury liquid. So the idea that this might somehow manufacture gold is not implausible. But it is also that incalescent mercury forms an amalgam with gold, generating much heat in a way that normal mercury does not. It's unclear to me what is going on here. Princip seems to refer to it as a known substance for which there is a real secret, while the Royal Society suggests it is not real. Princip wrote a book about this, The Aspiring Adept, about Robert Boyle and his alchemical quest. For the record, I am unclear where Princip is standing here on the reality of incalescent mercury and exactly what it is. There might be something lost in translation here. The philosophical mercury is not identified as being able to transform lead into gold, but rather seen as a step on the way. It produced a mercury that was very good at dissolving gold. It is unclear to me whether this is real. For example, pure mercury actually is good at dissolving gold. So maybe this is literally a purification of mercury using a copper process. See the article of mercury growing hot and cold communicated in the Transactions of the Royal Society, February 21, 1675, Robert Boyle. In the article, in retrospect, the sceptical chymist, Princip states that at the time, chymistry was a dirty commercial business not suitable for university study. Boyle wanted to turn it into a more pure university study. Boyle, rather than making alchemy into an experimental science, was trying to turn a practical craft into a theoretical science. As a mostly non-chemical but strongly related point, Homburg in the last decades of the 17th century took up a strong interest in manufacturing of metals and visited various foundries in Europe. At one of these foundries in Sweden, Homburg recounts that he saw workers trying to impress, placing a piece of wood in the molten copper and retrieving it with their bare hands, dipping into metal without harm. Homburg suspected a trick, did not try it himself. However, I heard this idea myself several times, and the Mythbusters series actually did try this one out with molten lead turned out that one must raise the temperature of the molten metal rather high so that the Leidenfrost effect, the evaporation of water from the surface of the hand, pushes the metal far enough away to prevent harm, at least for a few seconds. What always comes to my mind is how many people got burned finding this out. Homburg worked on a number of matters, including being one of the first to recognise the idea of creating an amalgam of mercury and phosphorus. And that brings us back to Chrysopoeia. The idea of manufacturing gold from, in particular, other metals, was part of the study of metallurgy, chem, alchemy, etc., from the Greco-Roman Egyptian origins until the end of Homburg's days. It was recognised that various metals were manufactured by combining other metals, and in particular that heat could be used to separate them, while other metals appeared to be prime. This mainly meaning that they did not associate under heating into several other metals. But even if this was the case, so that metals tin, zinc, lead, gold, silver, mercury and iron were in some way prime, that did not imply that they absolutely could not be converted one into another, just that the process was harder. In modern terms, nuclear reactions will achieve this, and the medieval theory included, at least in terms of basic structure, though not in terms of sophistication, the idea of a strong mixture that is analogous to the 21st century idea of nuclear reactions. They had the details wrong, but the basic idea was not unreasonable. The point, however, should be contrasted with the point that at the start of the Académie Royale de Science in 1666, a declaration was made by Colbert, the founder, that no work on the Philosopher's Stone was to be conducted. He also forbade research into astrology. However, Colbert's reasoning was probably not a recognition that these topics would be classified as pseudoscience in the 21st century, so much as being just generally too hot to handle, especially if they worked. So any work of Homburg on Chrysopoeia would have been against the policy of the Academy. 
The Academy was not against Chrysopoeia on the principle that it was pseudoscience, but on the principle that gunpowder for the king and medicines were more important, and that Chrysopoeia tended to be lengthy work with very little progress. Until around 1722, when the paper of Geoffroy came out, it was part of the mainstream of chymistry, and that paper was not about any pseudoscientific status of the ideas, but about the observation that many who professed to study it were frauds looking to cash in. The fraud part was to do with it being a gold mine for cons rather than the core research being against the results of experimentation. The position of Principe on this, and I concur, is that the real issue is that the Academy was trying to give itself a shiny public face, and since there was much controversy over Chrysopoeia, it was something that one needed to distance oneself from for purely political reasons. Inside the Academy, the chief chemist Samuel Duclos continued to study on the topic, but this was kept mostly quiet. There is a claim that on his deathbed Duclos repudiated the topic, but as the witnesses to this were biased, and if Duclos simply studied it as an empirical or natural philosophical pursuit, then there would be little reason for him to give any kind of deathbed repudiation, even if he felt the theory was likely incorrect. In conclusion, Homburg was both an alchemist and a chemist, and a chemist, because until he died, there was not really that much difference between the terms. In 21st century terms, it is hard to classify him because the meaning of the words has changed. In 21st century language, he is a chemist, not a proto-chemist, a chemist, but using theories that might be called prototypical of the late 19th century theories. But this does not mean that in the 17th century, he was not also an alchemist. <laughs>